Okay, I changed uh, slightly the title of my talk because I'm going to talk, uh, um, instead of talking about patterns and uh, mechanisms of pattern formation in general, I'm going to start with a specific problem and then we will look at uh, these uh, patterns at uh, different scales. So I will uh, focus in general on the uh, major uh, changes in vegetation uh, uh, patterns uh, in uh, um, arid environments. And uh, the uh, major changes we observe are either changes in uh, plant, communi plant community composition on, or changes in uh, uh, cover. Their implications are, uh, we have, might, have, might have various implications like uh, losses in uh, rangeland productivity, uh, land degradation, uh, activation of, uh, or intensification of dust emissions uh, uh, from uh, drylands. Uh, one of the major changes in plant community compositions that has been observed in uh, uh, arid uh, landscapes uh, is uh, the encroachment of woody plants into uh, arid grasslands. This uh, change happened uh, in many places around the world within a time frame of uh, about 100 years uh, and led to the replacement of a grassland with a, a shrubland. Uh, this is a global phenomenon. These uh, blue dots show uh, a places around the world where this phenomenon has been reported many times are at the edges of deserts and also at the edges of areas affected by fires. The mechanism involves the transition from a relatively uniform, not uniform, but a uniform at least in the distribution of soil properties, vegetation cover, grass cover, where there isn't much transport of soil to a, a landscape where we have uh, uh, very scattered uh, shrubs and uh, erosion in the interspaces and the deposition of some of the eroded particles uh, in the, uh, in the uh, shrub patches. So initially we have grasslands that have some uh, very scattered shrubs, but over time the grasses are lost. This could be due to a number of factors. For example, grazing could, could be one of them and uh, uh, the replacement uh, with uh, a, a landscape that has mostly bare soil and a few uh, vegetation shrubs. And over time, in particular on sandy soils, this uh, leads to the formation of uh, small dunes. What is typical of this process is that it's abrupt and hard to revert. There have been uh, many uh, rangeland um, management uh, uh, programs trying to uh, go back from the uh, shrubland to the grassland, and many, most of them they have not been successful. So when we observe something that is abrupt and uh, uh, almost irreversible, we tend to think that uh, this could be a transition in a system that has to um, alternative t stable states, uh, the grassland and the shrubland. This transition can be uh, due to a number of factors, exogenous factors, uh, for example, an increase in atmospheric CO2 con uh, concentration, uh, nitrogen deposition, uh, uh, climate warming, or uh, just uh, even more uh, management related, like uh, gra intensification of grazing pressure or, or fire management. But uh, uh, regardless of the driver, this type of behavior requ uh, requires uh, the uh, presence of uh, a, a feedback. And the typical feedback that is typically invoked to explain the emergence of this behavior is uh, the uh, fire vegetation feedback, whereby the loss in grass cover leads to a decrease in uh, fire frequency, which in turn leads to a decrease in mortality of shrubs and uh, uh, further enhances the uh, uh, encroachment of uh, uh, woody plants. Uh, wherever the fires are not present, the other typical feedback that we could uh, consider is the one that uh, the loss of, of grass cover leads to an increase in erosion, which in turn leads to a, a loss of soil resources, and which uh, prevents the reestablishment of grasses. But there is another mechanism that has been often overlooked, uh, which involves uh, the uh, microclimate vegetation feedbacks. In this case, we have that uh, an uh, increase in uh, shrub cover modifies the surface energy balance in a way that uh, there is a, a, a warming, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, system is less affected by very severe uh, cold uh, nights which uh, in the case of uh, uh, shrubs that are sensitive to low temperatures uh, uh, constitutes again a physical uh, a positive feedback. Uh, so shrubs are ecosystem engineers and so we could add to what we have seen today to the eco, geo and hydro, we can add also the atmo 
in the sense that there is going to be, uh, in this case, a feedback that uh, is with a, a physical environment which involves, again, the uh, near surface atmosphere. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, feedback usually is investigated in the context of uh, three lines, in the context of the Arctic tree line, the transition from boreal forest to tundra, or alpine tree lines, transition from, again, alpine forest to uh, alpine meadows. There are, uh, wherever we have a, a woodland to uh, grassland transition that uh, is uh, controlled by uh, low temperatures, we can define that uh, as a tree line. And then if we do that, we recognize that there are other tree lines. I really like this one, for example, the tree line between uh, uh, mangroves and marshes. Is, uh, mangroves clearly are, are uh, confined to the tropics because uh, they are uh, called intolerant plants. And in some areas, uh, they are present as uh, alternative stable states uh, in the system, exactly for the, because of the feedbacks we have been uh, talking about. But today, going back into, to drylands, the uh, transition between grassland and, uh, and shrubland can be controlled by uh, low temperatures. In the case of some of the American deserts, we have uh, the major uh, uh, shrub species are creosols. And uh, in uh, these environments, uh, the uh, encroachment uh, and the uh, uh, latitudinal range of creosols is uh, uh, clearly controlled by, uh, by uh, their uh, low tolerance uh, for uh, cold uh, winter uh, conditions. And uh, uh, this, uh, um, particularly in, in the North American deserts, uh, the Larea tridentata is uh, um, um, known for being uh, uh, for having a low cold tolerance. It's uh, uh, in case of freezing on the xylem, it uh, undergoes uh, uh, embolism, and at a temperature of about minus 19 Celsius degrees, uh, they have uh, a complete embolism. Interestingly, these authors found that uh, the minus 19 uh, Celsius correspond to the uh, northern uh, boundary of. Uh, um, uh, in, of the region in which uh, uh, this shrub is uh, uh, found. And uh, over the Holocene, uh, this shrub has been migrating northward uh, because of the as an, uh, response to warming. So um, since we are talking about this, the North American deserts, I will show now some results that uh, refer to this area, the Sevilleta uh, uh, Wildlife Refuge, which uh, is uh, one of the northernmost points in which uh, the uh, Laria Tridentata is found. Um, in this uh, uh, landscape, we can find uh, shrublands in the south and uh, grasslands in the north and a transition zone in the middle. And uh, if we look at the temperature records from grasslands and uh, uh, shrubland sites, uh, which are um, adjacent to one another, we find that uh, consistently the grassland has uh, uh, lower uh, minimum uh, winter temperatures than uh, the, um, than, uh, so the grassland has lower than the shrubland. And uh, so overall, there is a difference of about two Celsius degrees uh, and even more if we look at the uh, colder nights. This is a pheno a mostly a winter phenomenon, in which is where we really care about this phenomenon because it's when the shrubs are, are more uh, affected uh, by, uh, uh, by these uh, uh, freezing events. And uh, it's uh, particularly strong in the, in the coldest uh, uh, nights. Um, it's a, a nocturnal phenomenon because if we look at the daytime temperatures, minimum temperatures, we tend to find that they all fall along the same line, the one-to-one -one line, but while uh, at night, consistently, we find that the grasslands are uh, uh, colder. And uh, this difference uh, usually starts uh, at sunset and mant is maintained throughout the night. It's stronger in particular in the case of uh, nights, of, of course, uh, where there is uh, more uh, um, uh, stratification, where there is more uh, uh, stable atmosphere and uh, lower uh, winds. And uh, we try to find uh, an, expa an explanation for this phenomenon. And when we look at the same of the surface uh, attributes, albedo and emissivity are the same. So this is clearly not a, an albedo story. What is really different is uh, the uh, vegetation cover. There is much more uh, bare soil in the shrubland than in the grassland. And there are differences in the uh, ground heat fluxes between, uh, in the day, in particular, between the shrubland and the grassland. If we look uh, at them in the uh, shrubland, we measure uh, ground heat fluxes uh, on bare soil and on shrubs. Uh, we find that uh, the uh, bare soil has uh, more ground heat flux because there is less uh, surface uh, uh, insulation. 
Same thing for the grassland. And because there is much more bare soil in the shrubland, overall, we find that there is a bigger uh, ground heat flux in the shrubland than in the grassland during the night. So uh, uh, this leads to a, a, a heating of the uh, ground surface, uh, more heating of the ground surface in the shrubland, a higher temperature in the shrubland, and overnight, uh, in the night, uh, this uh, gives uh, a, a higher uh, long wave radiation from the surface. So if we now try to relate uh, these uh, fluxes uh, to the, the difference in temperature between uh, these two line covers, we can take a, a very simplified model. It would be like a, a one layer uh, of air close to the surface, uh, and we measure the different fluxes. We uh, calculate the energy balance for this uh, surface layer, and we use different fluxes for the different uh, uh, um, line covers uh, using the uh, results from our uh, measurements. And what we find, uh, that uh, we can more or less explain with this very simplified model like this one, the emergence of a difference in temperature between the shrubland and the grassland. Then if we play, go back and we uh, use the same fluxes between the, the two different line covers, in the two different line covers, except for one, we can identify the uh, flux that really makes the difference. And this is uh, the is flux in long wave, long wave radiation from the surface. So, so this is in agreement with the me mechanism we were proposing and then we used also a, a mesoscale model, the uh, WORF, coupled with the NOAA and surface model in a very simplified domain, initialized with uh, uh, our radiosound uh, sounding measurements. And uh, we found that uh, the model is able to uh, show and reproduce the emergence of uh, this uh, difference in temperature as a result of the different vegetation cover. So the implications are that uh, if we take a, a is, are that mainly the, because uh, of the sensitivity of these uh, 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 shrubs uh, to uh, low temperatures. We might have, uh, and uh, if we take the temperature record uh, for, for this system, the, what, what, this, uh, just as an example, these 10 years, a shrub uh, growing in the middle of the grassland would be exposed to many more uh, uh, mortality events than uh, uh, shrubs uh, play, uh, growing uh, within a shrub canopy. And again, this uh, shows that uh, there is uh, an effect of uh, ecosystem engineering in which uh, shrubs modify the physical environment, in this case, they, to their own advantage. So uh, going, uh, how can this uh, type of behavior lead to the emergence of uh, the bicycle dynamics I was talking about? We can show this with a very simplified model in which the woody plant biomass undergoes a logistic growth and a cold-induced mortality term that is very simply represented in this way. We saw that there is a high mortality for low temperature, no mortality for relatively high temperature. In the middle, there was like a linear decrease. Then at the same time, woody plants modify the physical environment by increasing the temperature linearly, for example. And so in a way that the temperature increases as a linear function of woody cover. If we put everything together, we find that this system, and again, it's a, it's a very naive simplified model, exhibits two uh, alternative stable states, at least within a certain range, which would correspond most likely to where the ecotone, uh, the transition zone between uh, the two uh, line covers uh, is. This, uh, uh, what is interesting to show is that uh, this feedback can explain some very large scale regional patterns uh, of, uh, um, of uh, uh, um, shrub uh, um, uh, cover. At the smaller scale, it's, an, it, it's not very effective because now if we take measurements done in the middle of the grassland or in the middle of the shrubland, we find that overall there is this uh, difference in temperature uh, of about two Celsius degrees but then if uh, at each of the one, uh, these uh, sites we consider microsites that are in uh, bare soil patches or in vegetated patches, we don't find much uh, uh, difference. So at the patch scale, there is no uh, clear, uh, feed, feed, th this feedback doesn't, uh, uh, is not uh, effective. So what can explain the uh, smaller uh, and the uh, heterogeneous uh, distribution of vegetation? What can uh, uh, explain uh, this uh, patchy, uh, patchy structure of uh, uh, shrubs in uh, these landscapes? We need to look at uh, the patch scale dynamics. And uh, as I said, uh, this uh, uh, encroachment of woody plants starts with uh, a grassland and with a few scattered uh, shrubs. 
because of grazing or other factors, uh, the grass layer is removed. At this point, uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, erosion processes uh, become uh, more intense uh, and lead to the removal of soil from the intercanopy areas and the deposition under the shrubs. At the same time, shrubs are, uh, don't have, uh, um, the shrubs are in a favorable condition for uh, expansion because they don't have competition from grasses. Uh, they are not affected by fires because there is more, no more the connectivity in the landscape that was given by the grasses and at the same time there is the additional input of nutrients for the from the surrounding area. Uh, over time this uh, leads to the formation of these napka dunes because uh, uh, particularly on sandy soils because there is a, an accumulation of soils on, uh, in these shrub patches. So the emergence of uh, um, these uh, spotted patterns of uh, uh, shrubs is often associated, um, is, can be uh, 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 the result of two competing processes. We have uh, on the one hand the wind and water that erode after the removal of grasses, they erode the uh, soil from the intercanopy area, while at the same time the shrubs start uh, spreading. So depending on which one is relatively faster than the other, we will have uh, the formation of bigger or smaller patches. And uh, um, this uh, uh, typical patchy landscape uh, affected by shrub encroachment, uh, these are two images taken from uh, uh, New Mexico. We can represent this with a, a very uh, simple uh, model in which we have uh, that uh, two state variables, the uh, shrub biomass and the soil resources. Uh, the uh, shrubs uh, in, uh, grow uh, according to a local dynamics, which is some sort of a logistic, which is constrained and where the carrying capacity depends on the available resources. And then there is a term of, uh, of special spread that is represented uh, again by a, a, a typical activator inhibitor process, where there is a, a positive feedback in, um, represented by this uh, term because of the presence of vegetation in the uh, surroundings a site is more likely to uh, to undergo uh, shrub encroachment and there is an inhibition um, uh, factor represented by this uh, uh, parameter in which uh, uh, the, uh, the um, spatial encroachment uh, is inhibited when the soil resources uh, go to zero or when the, um, uh, already the uh, shrub canopy is at carrying capacity. Then for soil resources we can use a, sim a very simple uh, model in which we represent uh, an increase in soil resources in sites where there is vegetation that is able to trap some of these uh, 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 of the soil eroded by the surroundings and there is an erosion function that uh, instead is uh, proportional to the lack of uh, vegetation and to the uh, uh, amount of uh, resources available at the site. And then there can be a background term of uh, atmospheric deposition. With a, a model like this one, we are able to reproduce patterns that are, uh, I would say, uh, have uh, similar uh, properties as the observed ones. And uh, in fact, uh, here we can compare the two uh, uh, um, patch sizes distributions in the two uh, landscapes, and more or less, uh, they are in agreement. This doesn't tell us that this is really the right uh, model and the right uh, uh, mechanism that uh, leads to the formation of these uh, patterns. So I'm going to show here two uh, alternative uh, explanations, so just to, uh, show, uh, to stress the fact that uh, most of these models uh, of uh, pattern formation don't uh, necessarily lead to any conclusive uh, result, unless we have uh, some observations that can tell us that uh, this is really the mechanism leading to this. For example, we can get uh, spotted patterns uh, with uh, a, a model, and there have been many people before us doing this, looking at uh, the effect of lateral uh, root expansion. This is very similar, to, for example, to the uh, studies by Lefebvre Lejeune, where they use uh, a kernel function that is, uh, an, is not only positive, as I had in the previous uh, case, but there is a negative, uh, mm, uh, the kernel function becomes negative at a certain distance, uh, because uh, of uh, the competition uh, between uh, uh, roots. If we do this, uh, uh, we can uh, combine this with uh, a very simple uh, model in which they, um, there is a, a term that is a just a linear term, and then there is this uh, term here of, uh, um, of a special interaction. 
this uh, model leads to a very spot, uh, spotted pattern. And, and this, uh, I would say that this is different from what uh, Max was showing to, uh, today. We get exactly geometrically the same patterns uh, as he does, but in our case, uh, there is no bistability in, in this system. We obtain this with, with a very uh, simple linearity. So this spotted pattern doesn't tell us anything about the effect, whether we are close or not to any critical threshold, because this, this system doesn't have any critical threshold. So this could be another example of a system that gives uh, this type of uh, spotted patterns. The third type of system I'm going to talk about, uh, a, a model that I'm going to talk about, uh, is uh, instead invokes uh, the, some, uh, the, an effect of environmental fluctuations. Uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, think of a system that undergoes uh, repeatedly a, a shift between uh, uh, stressed and unstressed conditions. For example, there could be very cold episodes, very cold winters that uh, lead to the mortality of some of the shrubs. And so over time, we tend to, we, lead, we use the shift between these, uh, these two dynamics uh, with these two different uh, functions. And we put ourselves in a condition where individually, these, uh, each one of these uh, dynamics don't lead uh, to any uh, pattern formation. But it's the switching between the two of them that leads to the formation of patterns. And even again, even in this case, we find, and with no, sur no surprise, uh, that uh, we can reproduce all that different variety of patterns, including these types of uh, spotted patterns that uh, are uh, typical of uh, uh, these um, uh, arid uh, uh, environments uh, with, uh, affected by shrub encroachment. So the reason why I, I propose here two different models is because I'm becoming a little bit skeptical about some of these uh, uh, studies, and I've been part of the studies myself in the sense that uh, um, and this would be nice to, to see us in the discussion tomorrow. I, um, there seems to be uh, that uh, these pat the same different models lead to the same patterns. So the reason uh, that uh, I, uh, being able to reproduce a certain pattern doesn't tell us anything about uh, the co correctness of, of the model. And um, the other thing, uh, the reason why I was talking, um, I mentioned this last pattern because this was in the ti initial title of the talk, which was about uh, the uh, possible uh, mechanisms of pattern formations induced by noise. Those, uh, this is, I think, an interesting research, uh, area of research because uh, uh, Oh, from what we have heard today, there's been the, the idea of uh, an increase in uh, intensification of extreme events or in intensification of uh, fluctu uh, the, uh, fluctuations, so in the variance of the fluctuation, uh, uh, we can, might think uh, uh, what is the impact of uh, the increase of, the, of this variance. And many times we have been looking at the, at the increases in the mean temperature, in the mean precipitation, etc. An increase in the fluctuation can have uh, an interesting, some interesting results, and this could be one of them. And um, so we uh, initially I wanted to present more mechanisms uh, of pattern formation. I'm going to refer you to, and uh, this is not self-advertisement, but we wrote this book mainly because uh, I think for an audience like this might be interested. So in this uh, book we, uh, did, we, look, uh, we looked at the different uh, uh, constructive effects of uh, environmental uh, noise. And, uh, and this is just one of the examples. And um, in conclusion, uh, I've been uh, showing how uh, regional uh, scale uh, patterns of uh, shrub encroachment are controlled by, uh, by uh, temperatures, in particular by uh, minimum temperatures, and how there is an effect of ecosystem engineering whereby uh, the uh, uh, shrub encroachment leads to a warming of the landscape, which favors the uh, spread of cold sensitive shrubs. The, uh, this, uh, uh, this phenomenon doesn't necessarily explain then uh, what type of configuration, what type of special patterns uh, emerge in the uh, landscape. And so other uh, phenomena like, uh, again, this uh, uh, interaction between uh, 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 the uh, uh, pace of uh, uh, shrub encroachment and uh, soil erosion and how they interact could be a better, lead to a better explanation of the patterns emerging uh, from uh, uh, this phenomenon of shrub encroachment. And with this, uh, I'm uh, done. Thank you. Questions? Um, yeah. So just uh, if you could just try to explain, because you were saying that in the case of the shrub, you had more bare soil, so you had more uh, soil heat flux uh, during the course of the day. 
but uh, what was the role of the of the shrub itself in that case? Because uh, I mean, in the limit, you go to the desert, and then you have bare soil, so it's it's warming more during the day than a grassland. But then it's obviously much cooler at night. Uh, so I'm just wondering. What, yeah, what, yeah. The, uh, this is a this is a, a good point. There is also uh, in sorry, there is also an effect uh, of. Uh, trapping of some of this uh, long wave radiation during the night but by the presence of the canopy or, or, yeah, yeah, of the shrub, true. which is similar to what has been observed also in uh, the higher latitudes or uh, altitudes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, during the break, uh, Scott reminded me of the book 1491, which uh, for the U.S., and, well, for the Americas, uh, points out that the population densities were very much higher um, pre-arrival uh, of Columbus, and that many of these landscapes were in no way in a natural state. For instance, in mount uh, mountains in the U.S. were called the Blue Mountains because there was so much smoke delivered from the burning processes. Have you thought about incorporating in your differential equations describing these events the periodic or management roles that may have given rise to these grasslands? Because it could be that these grass systems were actually always unstable and were, all, were, were managed into the condition that we, found, that we are now seeing them transition out of. Well, th this is a very good point. There is an interesting literature on this, in fact, uh, trying to argue for uh, um, uh, a very similar point that uh, these, uh, some of these uh, uh, grasslands uh, were uh, affected also by pre-Columbian uh, pre uh, societies mm -hmm. and uh, and then the system uh, might not have been in a stable state. Of course, nobody will ever uh, will never have a, a final answer. But there is, a, yeah, the only difference is that with respect to the 1491 is uh, the increase in temperature that is happening now. Well, the interesting thing is that one could argue, not that we trust these models too much, that uh, demonstrating that in many different ways that these are unstable situations almost argues that how did they ever get into this uh, this grassland condition? And that if it's if it's always if it's intrinsically unstable, then that would really strongly support the the management impact uh, to get higher uh, animal productivity, for instance, that would give it, uh, more hunting. Yeah, I agree with you. There have been uh, uh, some studies trying to relate also the. Uh, changes in the uh, reproductive capacity of, of uh, some of these, uh, I'm not an ecologist, but of some of these grasses. Apparently they used to reproduce much more often from seeds in the past, and the seed repro uh, reproduction from seed has changed uh, okay, over uh, the last few centuries. So uh, there could be other things that have happened and might have uh, uh, destabilized the grasses. Thank you. May, may I continue on that a little bit? Yeah. Here, Paolo. yeah. Uh, because uh, I am struck by the differences in approach of shrublands. Uh, if you compare the Americas with, for example, here in the Mediterranean, if you compare your talk with that of uh, Moshe Shahak, Moshe was like explaining uh, like uh, how this shrubland uh, system functions and how healthy it was and how uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in the Americas, it seems to be like the shrubland is bad, it's degraded, it's so I, I like this discussion very much. So I was wondering, like, how should we see the shrublands in, 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 in like, the Yordana range? Uh, it's always presented as a degraded state. Started with the paper of Schlesinger, I think. Uh, well, it could indeed be the, 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 the normal healthy state uh, that, uh, that functions, like, uh, beautifully, as uh, Moshe explained. Well, uh, th this is a, a very good um, question because uh, the, uh, I, I agree with you up to a certain point in the sense that uh, it depends on what is the alternative to the shrub. If uh, the alternative to the shrub is a bare soil, I agree th with you that it's better a, a shrub than nothing. But if you have a grassland with re relatively continuous cover that uh, maintains the soils in place uh, and uh, where there is much less erosion, I would definitely prefer the shrubland. But of course, this is a... a the, the tendency also in, in some of the studies to recognize the fact that grasslands are a productive uh, ecosystem so because of the, also the economical value they have uh, to be used as rangeland, while the, the shrublands don't, don't have the similar yeah, thing. I, the, but I however, yeah. when we look uh, at uh, very degraded la landscapes uh, like uh, uh, some areas of southern Africa and you uh, see that uh, the uh, grasses are gone, 
and uh, all the perennial grasses are gone, for example. So there are annual grasses that are ineffective in stabilizing soils, introducing there or allowing the, the encroachment of shrubs for sure, sure is, a, is a good thing because uh, at least uh, limits uh, or reduces partly the erosion. Yeah. What, one of the differences that uh, jumps out at me between your grassland and shrub, shrubland uh, environment is just the fact that in your shrubs you develop these opportunities for channelization between in your bare zones between your shrubs. I'm just wondering, do we have any measurements of soil moisture that would correspond with uh, sort of a grassland to shrubland? just grass and shrub, uh, just to get at a sense of where the water table is in these two different places. Because it certainly seems to me that once you, lower, you, know, once you develop channels, you have the opportunity for lower water tables that you know, leads to uh, a difference between your deeper and shallower rooted species. I'm just wondering if we have experimental or, or physical observations that give us a basis for looking at that. Well, there have been studies clearly on, on soil, soil moisture in these environments, but uh, uh, in most cases uh, I know of that there is no water table. In a sense, there is the water table somewhere deeper in the soil, but not, uh, uh, but uh, at least in the system I was talking about, uh, it is out of the reach of, of plants, as far as I know. But could you substitute the word uh, deep percolation or, 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 or modestly deep percolation for water table? I mean, that's... What do you mean? Sorry. Well, I mean, the point being that, that what is the, the degree of percolation, say, below a half meter depth? So giving, giving a benefit to deeper rooted species. You know, you, you, does, the, does one system or the other give rise to a, a different structural pattern in the soil moisture with depth? Uh, there have been some studies, but uh, honestly, I haven't, I haven't done those. And, uh, 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 at this point, I don't remember, honestly. Yeah. Amir Karay. So do you, uh, you mentioned the alternative between uh, uh, grassland, bare soils, and, and shrubs, of course, uh, doing so much uh, soil things. Are you aware of any model that, that has got these three possibilities and groups that would be good for our study? Yeah, yeah, there are some models. Uh, in fact, uh, if you want, uh, there can be a whole spectrum of uh, landscape degradation in which if we uh, use this uh, sort of scale of values, the grasslands are better. And uh, you go from the grasslands to shrublands, and then after re repeated disturbances of the shrublands, since it doesn't become a grassland, you just have a more and more loss uh, of soil resources all the way to, re um, to remain really in a, in a final uh, uh, bare state. Well, uh, it depends on uh, if you in, 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 if in these models you uh, include these repeated disturbances. In the end, uh, from the shrubland, you go all the way down to the to the bare soil. So uh, you might even argue that the shrubland is uh, not even a state uh, in the longer run, but uh, you will go down there. But, there is a clearly, you either have two or three, but uh, no more than that. Because uh, there is a, a continuous spectrum of grass covers that you can have in this uh, uh, um, trajectory. Yeah. I have a, <coughs> sorry, a question and a comment because of uh, what uh, Max asked. First of all, a question. If the productivity and the diversity of the shrubland is higher or lower than the grassland? What, what is uh, the answer the in, in no your system? I'll tell you later. What no, no, no. I, I so clearly the product productivity is higher in the, in the, in the, at least in the ones I'm talking about in the shrubland. In the shrubland? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's higher. The diversity, the, of course, you are losing species, right? So in terms of grasses, but at the same time, there, be, there are many people studying the effect uh, of uh, uh, the different habitat for uh, mammalians, uh, uh, smaller predators, uh, etc. So I don't know if there is a, 
a conclusive uh, result in that one. Okay, what we found for, for sure that the diversity and uh, the productivity is much higher in the grassland because of the uh, very simple law of desert. In desert, if you will, all the desert will be covered with soil and the water will be distributed uniformly after a day, most of the water will evaporate and the diversity and the productivity will, very, will be very low. So redistribution of resources is the most important single factor for changing diversity and uh, uh, production. And that is different. When you have a shrubland, you have redistribution of water on a much higher level than you have grassland. That's, I think, the reason why shrubland is more fertile than grassland. In the United States, of course, they need grassland because of grazing. This is another story. But from simple ecosystem point of view, redistribution of water will result in much higher productivity and diversity. And the second, as you remember in my talk in the morning, I showed you how the shrubland crust was... Uh, all the shrubs in the area died. And now we have data after a few years, and it's becoming a grassland, but with very low uh, productivity because there is mainly one species, stipa, that cover all the area. So here in Israel, we have a real uh, state change from shrubland to grassland. And is the grassland uh, native? Uh, is yeah. the grass is na native? Or yeah, yeah, it's okay. native. It's uh, uh, occupied mainly by one species, as I said, uh, uh, stipa, and so on. So I think that when we are talking about the two uh, state of the system, we have to talk from ecological point of view and from range management point of view, and it's not uh, the same conclusions. Okay. Well, uh, I wear now my hat as a session chair. Thank you very much for your attention. And